Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. This week's episode features Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan, former director of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center at the Pentagon. I spoke to General Shanahan a month ago, the week before he retired. Unfortunately, getting a clear line into the depths of the Pentagon is difficult, and the audio is less than could be desired. Nonetheless, General Shanahan has a unique perspective on the use of AI in the military. General Shanahan started his career as a fighter pilot for the U.S. Air Force, flying the F-4 Phantoms and F-15E Strike Eagles. He moved on to successive senior roles at the Department of Defense, where he developed an expertise in artificial intelligence. He was instrumental in starting Project Maven, an effort to integrate state-of-the-art computer vision into drone technology. From there, he was asked to start the DOD Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, or JAKE, the central hub for the military's AI efforts. General Shanahan spoke about the challenge of nurturing innovation within an oftentimes rigid and multi-layered organization like the DOD, and what steps he believes the U.S. needs to take to stay competitive with other countries in the coming years. I hope you find this conversation as inspiring as I did. If you could start by giving us some idea of who you are, where you grew up, where you went to school, and then how you ended up as director of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center at the Pentagon. I'm Jack Shanahan, Lieutenant General of the United States Air Force, and grew up in Massachusetts. My father was a professor of mathematics at the College of Holy Cross in Massachusetts. And we grew up a little bit in England, taking sabbaticals in places like Cambridge, Oxford, and University of Sussex. I went to the University of Michigan and joined the Air Force ROTC program. Always wanted to fly. Started a year in a town called Duxford, England. A very small village at the time, and it was an old World War II airfield. Right before we showed up in 1970, they just finished filming scenes from the Battle of Britain. It was the first movie I ever saw in a movie theater, and it was there in England. So I decided I wanted to join the United States Air Force. I entered ROTC, uh, University of Michigan, Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry, graduated in four years, and went into the United States Air Force and started in the F-4 and spent some time in the F-4 Phantom, and then eventually transitioned to the F-15E Strike Eagle. How I ended up as the director of the Trek, the best I can say was a very circuitous route to get here. I spent the first 15 years flying, the very typical of an aviator in the United States Air Force, as a weapons systems officer in those two airplanes. But at the end of that 15 years, as much as I loved flying, and I was passionate about flying, I also understood I couldn't fly forever, and then it was a young person's business in many ways. And a series of opportunities began to open up for me over the course of the next 15 years of my career in very diverse areas, such as command and control wing commander or an intelligence group commander, working on the policy staff in the Pentagon, working in the United States Pacific Command Headquarters. I spent a year in Korea on a staff over at Osan Air Base and eventually ended up down in San Antonio in charge of an organization in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance of about 26,000 people and took that through a major transformation as an organization reporting to very different people above me. So it was a pretty big transformation. And from there, came back to the Pentagon for the third time into what is called the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. And as part of my responsibilities in the USDI and the jargon we called it, I was looking at ways that we could automate, augment, and accelerate exploitation of full motion video coming off of drones, remotely piloted aircraft. FMV is is what we call it, full motion video. Very time consuming, very laborious. Thousands and thousands of analysts were staring at screens for 12 hours at a time, just mind-numbing in so many ways, but you had to look at this video because it was in combat operations in different places around the world. So we embarked on this project 
thanks to a Marine Corps colonel, equally passionate and dedicated about finding a solution and turning to artificial intelligence, machine learning, and computer vision very specifically for that project. And we proposed a pilot project to who was then the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bob Work. And I call Bob Work the patron saint of algorithmic warfare. He was the driver behind the stand-up of, we call Project Maven, but he liked the term algorithmic warfare cross-functional team because he envisioned the future of algorithms against algorithms in a very high-end combat scenario in the future. And so I was the first director and stood up Project Maven. I was just a fascinating, hard, challenging experience. I was sort of trying to do a startup organization in the institutional bureaucracy of the Pentagon. But thanks to the Marine Corps colonel, we made enormous progress in a very short amount of time that people said was really impossible in some ways. That We had startup companies, four of them on contract in the first four or five months. We had Google on contract just a couple of months after that and began to show some progress to the point The question was then asked, that is all about intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. We need this for the Department of Defense. Eric Schmidt, on the outside at this point in the Defense Innovation Board, is rightfully but very critical of the department for not embracing what was happening in commercial industry every single day, which was this transformation, almost to the point of a revolution in artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing. He pushed the department very hard, and as a result of that, when they needed a first director, of this joint AI center, the Jake, they looked around and didn't find a lot of people that had any experience whatsoever in this emerging tech site that also knew what it took to sort of stand up a brand new organization and grow it and add people and money to it. I did say no when first asked. I had planned to retire anyway. And I knew after almost two years of Project Made and the challenges of doing this. It's like Going from one startup to another, but multiplying the challenges by an order of 10 or 50, you know, it was much bigger for the department. But was convinced that this was a historic opportunity for the department. And if not me, then who else could take the position? So I accepted it on sort of a limited time. I said a year, but could not have left last December. The organization was not ready to sort of keep the momentum moving. So I stayed for another six months, which brings me to the point I am today of a year and a half into this and retiring very soon. As far as I know, I am the only senior official in the Department of Defense who has led not one, but two AI fielding organizations, not R&D, not research and development, but fielding organizations. I say that not in any way to boast, but that's a lament that we do not have senior leaders with this sort of experience. We need to grow more of them, which is part of an opportunity for me to leave to bring somebody else in. This is something we've got to introduce much more across the entire department, which is one of the big challenges among many of standing up this organization. So that brings me almost 36 years later from coming out of University of Michigan in 1984 to walking out the door as a joint person as well as a United States Air Force Airman. The NSCAI, the National Security Commission on AI, has just put forward these first quarter recommendations, and they talk quite a bit about the Jake and the need to elevate its visibility and have it report directly to the Secretary of Defense. You talked about the challenges and what a difficult role it was to develop programs or develop the Jake itself. Can you talk about those challenges and how you feel about the NSCAI's recommendations? Let me start with the challenges, and this is atypical for anybody in a startup organization in commercial industry. We had four people. I call it a startup band in a garage at the beginning. No money, no people, not really any place to work out of. And in what I would call almost a canonical method of doing things in the department, somebody signed a memo saying, go get AI fixed for the Department of Defense. Go figure it out. We had to find people six months at a time and then year long and now we're starting to finally bring permanent people into the organization. We had to fight and claw away for money in that first year, but had strong support from within senior leaders of the Department of Defense, but also in Congress. Found a place to work out of, which we've already reached capacity on because we've grown so fast. So in June of 2018, we had four volunteers and no formal funding. Now we are, as of today, 185 people, which is both government personnel, military and civilians, and contractors, and a healthy budget of over $240 million for the fiscal year, and a healthy funding profile over the course of the next five years. 
and that may be as important as anything I could talk about is the stability of long-term funding. We were living, we we're going to be living year to year, and there's no way to sort of stand up a high-priority tech organization is sort of survive on whatever you could get year to year. So we've built this up. So the other question you asked, which was about the National Security Commission on AI and sort of visibility authorities. The visibility piece a year ago was true. So we've worked hard on the Jake brand and marketing and making people understand what we were here to do, what our mission was, what our vision was. I've worked endless hours trying to just get our brand out there. So the visibility and having the Secretary of Defense call AI his number one technology modernization priority is by itself great visibility. The fact that we were able to get a five-year funding profile made all the difference in the world. Those that were here to stay. But also on the authorities piece of it, this is somewhat what the commission was getting at. And we've had a fantastic relationship with the commissioners themselves, as well as the staff, who have worked very closely with us on charting the future of AI and DoD. But one of their recommendations was to eventually move the Jake out from under the chief information officer of the department, underneath either the deputy secretary of defense or the secretary. I understand that intent, and I accept that should happen eventually, but under the current chief information officer, the Honorable Dana Deasy, he has an almost impossible task of figuring out how to make the Department of Defense modernize, a sort of digital modernization. And he has all the elements of digital modernization. He has cloud, he has cyber, he has AI, he has C3, command control and communications, and also data as that fifth element underlying all of it. The fact that he understands AI, it came from business. He was not a government person. He was not a military person. He came from business and understood what it took to modernize something as large and as unwieldy as the department. We're in the right place under him. But eventually, at some point, he walks out the door. And then how, in this bureaucratic environment, with not everybody a proponent of new organization, how do you survive? And so part of what the commission was getting at was, I know Bob Work and Eric Schmidt talk about this frequently, is giving it that level of visibility day in, day out, beyond the current chief information officer that lets this thrive and everybody understands it's a priority for the Department of Defense. So that was their big recommendation. They also made a recommendation about the three-star general or admiral continuing to be the director of the Jake, and that has now happened. There was some question for a little while of if it would become a civilian position, but there will be another three-star coming in behind me at some point once he works his way through the confirmation process. In other words, there was or there is an infrastructure there that reports directly to the Secretary of Defense, and you're somewhat ambivalent about taking it away from the CIO. Is that it? I'm an ardent advocate for keeping it where it is under the current CIO, but I understand and accept that it would be hard to find anybody else that comes in with his background and understanding. For somebody that never wore a uniform, he understands the warfighting pieces of what we're trying to do better than anybody I've ever met in a position similar to his. So when he departs, as all political appointees eventually depart, then I support a different place in the organization just to maintain the necessary visibility on the Jake day-to-day. I wanted to ask what you thought were a few of the most important implementations of machine learning in the military over the next five years. That's kind of a broad question, but presumably you have in mind two or three or four projects that you think are critical to get done. Yeah, I would start by saying I don't know of any aspect of the Department of Defense that would not benefit from artificial intelligence in some way, shape, or form. The question is, what can you do in what sequence to show return on investment? How complicated can the problem be at the beginning and what's mature enough to take on as a problem set? But it is, to me, everything from the back office to the battlefield, from undersea to cyberspace and outer space, everything in there could benefit from artificial intelligence. The question is, what's the priority of doing it? And we go through a series of questions that I would expect would be no different than most industries, like what kind of data is available to train the model? How does it align with the overall priorities of the Department of Defense? Is there a commercial solution that is readily available that can be quickly adapted to the purposes of the department using the department's data, not commercial data? 
we have solicited inputs from all the different military services and the global combatant commands who are interested in making their operations more effective, more efficient, better and faster decisions, all of which some sort of AI capability is, is tailor-made for. So as we've gone through that, we've prioritized internally on what the customer has been looking for in, in areas such as command and control, or fighting operations, everything from airborne sensors and platforms and submarines with acoustic intelligence. I could name a dozen different ones very quickly, but all of them related to future war fighting operations. But those are also higher consequence and higher risk. So our approach is probably similar to a lot of other organizations in commercial industry. Start with some of the lower consequence, lower risk use cases. Learn, build muscle memory, understand what the AI fielding pipeline should look like from data ingest, data munching, data curation, labeling, all the way to training a model, doing test and evaluation, validation, verification on that model, integrating it into some weapon system, and then learning how to sustain. At the same time, in addition to all of that sort of technical work, is a policy review, a legal review. How could we adopt our AI ethics principles into development of this capability? What does international engagement look like? Should we have an international partner on these capabilities? We work through those early on in the Jake on two areas in particular, predictive maintenance on an H-60 helicopter, as well as humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And mainly that was mapping wildfire perimeters and doing post-hurricane building damage assessment, road obstructions, things like that. Very important subjects, very important projects, but of lower consequence than saying trying to put AI-enabled capabilities in an autonomous system, a remotely piloted aircraft or some other weapon system. We understand the consequences of those are so enormous. We need to understand how to do the sort of easier projects, and nothing is easy when it comes to DoD and AI, but the lower risk cases, and we've worked our way through those. Wildfire alert system, I was interested by that. Why did that rise to the top of the heap? Part of it was the summer of 2018 or 19, where you had the hurricanes on the East Coast and devastating wildfires on the West Coast simultaneously. The only thing that, as I say, was missing was plague and locusts. It's a horrible, horrible summer and fall. And thanks to Project Maven, who had already developed some of these computer vision capabilities for full motion video, in the Jake, we saw this as one of our first opportunities to come in and make a difference. So worked with everybody from the firefighters out in California to the forestry service to first responders. We knew we could make some impact in the shorter term because of the work that Project Maven had already done. And it was a glaring need. You're seeing these people on the back of pickup trucks with acetate grease pencils trying to map a fire line. By the time they got the information, it might have been as old as 12 hours old. And that could have destroyed a couple of towns in those 12 hours in these fast-moving wildfires. This has been a passion of a lot of people in the Drake. So it's been embraced by everybody. And now we're close to the point we're demonstrating near real-time and soon-to-be real-time mapping through full-motion video and other sources of sensor data to come in and putting down on a first responder device, handheld device, that gives a lot more information and quicker. This has been such an important initiative. So we've worked our way up now to we have some cyber work that's going on. We're doing very interesting things in warfighter health. Everything from suicide intervention, prevention mitigation, to digitizing joint pathology center samples of 55 million slides that have various diseases and viruses put on them and that need to be digitized and apply machine learning against them. And then, as I said, this idea of joint warfighting operations. And the one that is not a headline grabber, but as anybody in industry doing this today knows, it's the quicker return on investment and saves the most time the fastest. It's just business transformation, robotic process automation, or RPAs, uh, lots of different areas that our military services have approached us with for help. So that's one area where we've been a little bit more aggressive because it's not AI per se, but it leads to better AI the more you adopt these bots and tools, RPA tools, to then set the stage for AI for the department. As I said, there is nothing that I can think of that could not benefit one way or another from artificial intelligence.
What is the process that Jake currently doesn't have contracting authority? So is the Jake currently a communication hub or a clearinghouse for private enterprise that's pitching capabilities and then you're looking out to agencies or projects that need those capabilities and recommending one contractor over another? Or are you, in effect, working on projects to the point that you need to sign a contract and then you hand it over to the General Services Administration and ask them to contract? How does it work? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And some companies don't want to work with the department. Why do we make it hard for them? It's contracting and acquisition. It never moves fast enough. And if you're a startup company that's trying to get money on the books in the fourth quarter, and you're told it will take you 18 months to get this on contract, you're just not going to do business with the Department of Defense. We've been working so hard at improving the acquisition and contracting process. We did this pretty well in Maven. In fact, the person running Project Maven was an acquisition certified professional. He knew how to make the system work for him. He wasn't stymied by the system day in and day out. But because of the lessons learned from Project Maven, one of the first things we did when we stood up to take is put an acquisition and contracting division inside of the organization. And I waited for the person that was recommended to me. And it took him a while to get hired, but he has now got us on this path of looking at every possible option to make the acquisition and contracting process far less onerous than it has been for companies looking at doing business with the DoD. Now, to what you said, we do not yet have acquisition authority within the J. There's some suggestion that Congress will support that in the future. But in the meantime, what I have to do is use other organizations, fairly substantial contracting arms to help us get contracts made and approved and signed. And that is anything from Defense Information Systems Agency has a contracting arm. You mentioned GSA have been enormously helpful as a partner. And even Defense Innovation Unit on the West Coast, I have a body out there that is my forward presence into the Defense Innovation Unit on the West Coast, and they have some nimble ways of getting things on contract fairly quickly. So we're doing better, and the process is getting faster and faster. And we'll find over time we can reduce from 18 months, and we're much, much shorter than that now in a case of just a couple of months to make this work even better we'll have to get our own acquisition authorities. It comes with an overhead with a lot of oversight when you have contracting and acquisition authority. But it's so important to us to convince people considering doing business with the department that we can move as quickly as we need to move to put them on contract. And I mentioned our presence out in Defense Innovation Unit. One of the key roles that person has for the organization for the Jake is to do market research and business intelligence, to go out working with a lot of different People, everybody from InQtel to a variety of VCs, private equity firms, DIU itself is a great scouting source for knowing what's out there. All the standard mechanisms is just soliciting where the capability is that we might need for a given project at a given time. It's still not enough. We have to grow that part of the Jake. There's so much interest in what we're doing. We're starting to attract a lot more attention from commercial industry. And we have to show them that we're listening to them, we will respond to them, even as to say, no, we don't need your capability right now. Many of them never worked with the department before. We don't have security clearances, they don't have clearances for their facilities, their building. We have to work our way through that. So we will continue to get better and better at that. But that has been one of our challenges as we've kind of worked our way through the first 18 months here. And so, because I do speak to a lot of startups who are interested, should startups approach the Jake directly or should they go through the Defense Innovation Unit? Come to us. And the DIU, we're such good partners with Mike Brown and the Defense Innovation Unit that we have a process in place now to triage, as we say, those entry points. Doug Drakely, my presence out on the West Coast, he'll take a pitch from anybody any day of the week. And then as a result of what we learned from that pitch, we then have a sequence of events that might kick in all the way down to a more formal discussion. You'll hear us putting out more and more. There's been several, you might have heard of, requests for information or RFIs. It's not an official contract. It's just, hey, we want to know who might have capabilities for this project we're interested in. That RFI goes out. We're trying to expand how we disseminate those RFIs. Putting it out through the standard Department of Defense process is just not going to reach 95% of the startups that aren't out there on government websites looking for business for the department. So we're doing better at getting that out to the people that might be interested in working with the department through that RFI process. And the answers to that RFI might then drive the next step, which is a request for a proposal, an RFP, 
which is a more formal request for what could you do in your capabilities that meet our requirements. It will work our way through all the way down to a more typical Defense Department selection process. And at the tail end of that, somebody will be awarded a contract and we kick off that contract. But that's it. We do have a process in place. And so come to the Drake. And even if the first answer might be no, it's never no flat out. It's no, not yet. But very interesting technology. I'd like to have you back and talk some more about it later. And you mentioned that there may be a move in Congress to get you acquisition authorization. That has to be in the National Defense Authorization Act, I presume. Is there a move to get that done in this next round in 2020? Some of the process is behind closed doors, so I can't say with a high level of confidence what is or is not happening, but I know there is interest in helping the Jake because everybody understands that this is a strategic competition. This is something the department has to embrace, and part of embracing AI is embracing a better acquisition and contracting and process. There are people looking at granting those authorities through the NDAA or the National Defense Authorization Act beginning in the next fiscal year, which starts 1 October of this year. I don't know how it comes out through conference as they go through markup over the next few weeks. And there will be a lot of questions about getting that authority. As I said earlier, it's not risk-free. It comes with sort of a level of oversight and accountability that would require adding people in a lot of training to the organization and the people in the organization. But yes, there is definite interest in it, and we just have to wait and see sort of what comes out of conference here in the next month. Booz Allen Hamilton got a big contract recently, and they're an integrator. Is there a role for very small startups to contract directly with the DOD, or is the DOT really favoring integrators to handle that interaction with the smaller companies? It's a very good question, and I know some smaller companies get concerned about the role of a prime integrator. We've done it in a variety of different ways, both in Project Maven when we started that project, but also into the JIG. But we have to have a contract vehicle, and it could be a direct contract under an existing contract vehicle. There are ways to do it. This idea of other transaction authorities can very rapidly go out and put a company on contract using, in this case, DIU, existing authorities for OTAs, other transaction authorities. It doesn't involve sort of a prime integrator. It's just a more direct relationship. Lots of opportunities for that. But what the prime integrators bring for the department, and this is where it's an important distinction, is they understand how the department works. They have people with security clearances. They understand sometimes, I even hate to say this, it does require people to understand the Byzantine processes of the Pentagon. They are not always as simplistic as they should be, although Undersecretary Ellen Lord in the acquisition and sustainment part of the department has been working in so many different ways to make this process much better, especially as it's more of a software company approach as opposed to a big hardware organization. There are ways to do it, but the prime integrator knows how to work with the department, and they're good at doing it. And we are clear sometimes in contract language, the role of an integrator is also to go out and find the best capabilities that exist in the United States. Not the biggest company, but the best capability for our problem set. I can't get involved day to day with that prime integrator is doing with any subcontracts, right? It's sort of outside of the role that we're allowed to do. But what we can do is part of the contract saying, we need every capability that exists that's best in breed for whatever we're asking for in this project. And through that, they're able to go out and get everybody from a small startup to a big company brought together as part of their integrator role. We did this with Project Maven. The prime integrator was ECS, and this is what they do. They're very good at, especially in the artificial intelligence side of the house. That's the role we're envisioning with Booz Allen here, who are bringing their A-team to the table understanding that we're looking for the best that's out there in the United States and maybe internationally if the capability exists somewhere else. The innovation world is hard here. No startup has everything we need to bring this to bear against complex weapon systems in the Department of Defense. Integrating into a department weapon system is hard, complex, big systems, big programs. Prime integrators understand the challenges of kind of working their way through that. But I'll tell you, my philosophy from the earliest days of Project Maven to today, as I get ready to exit stage left, is commercial first philosophy, and everybody's an equal player, from the startup to the biggest companies. We went after small startups in Project Maven, but we also had Google on contract. It was not one or the other. It was, just give me the best that's out there. In this case, it was the best computer vision in a couple of different companies. So we're always seeking the best. It's a question of where that best is. 
Yes, it's sometimes hard to go up against the big companies because of the size of their workforce and the incredible tech they bring in. But every day, there are PhD students coming out of Berkeley, Stanford, Carnegie, you name it, that are eager to start a company and make a difference. And a lot of them want to make a difference for national security. So I'm encouraged by the response. We're over the Maven days. I firmly believe we've got a lot of that behind most of that, if not all of it, behind us. Maven is a drone project, and I'm sort of fascinated by swarm technology. The Chinese have been aggressive on pursuing swarm technologies. And the National Security Commission on AI's recommendations after the first quarter led with the mention of swarm technology. Can you tell us what the DOD is doing on swarm technology? A little bit. And and let me start with the China piece. China says some positive things about ethical use of AI, yet they're also blatant in advertising in their company brochures on some of their big weapons companies, fully AI-enabled autonomous weapon systems, which we're not doing in the Department of Defense. We're very careful about the approach we will take to AI-enabled autonomous weapon systems. We're trying to essentially boasting about the capabilities and selling some of their drones to Middle Eastern countries. So we know what their intent is. We take a much different approach. We take a measured approach to understanding how we would do this in a safe, ethical, and lawful way. But on the swarming technology, I look at the future of the department and I look at weapon systems and we're at a watershed moment. And COVID-19, for many reasons, is a watershed moment for the Department of Defense. One aspect is just we've completely moved to teleworking environment. It's a wake-up call that we truly are in a digital battle. So we have to adapt to a different future, a digital modernized future. And what that means to me is you start decreasing investments in so-called legacy systems, big capital investments. More and more, the future is about smaller, cheaper, unmanned, autonomous, and eventually AI-enabled autonomy. People sometimes conflate autonomous weapon systems or autonomous systems, period, with AI-enabled autonomous systems. Very different. We've had autonomy in the department for a long time. We have not had AI-enabled autonomous systems, so we're taking a methodical approach to doing that. But there is no question in my mind that the swarming is a part of our future. And you've seen, I think it was Dr. Will Roper, who's now on the Air Force side of acquisition, was on 60 Minutes, maybe been a year and a half or so ago, and he did a demonstration of swarming drone capability. Much of that is still on the research side of the Department of Defense. The mandate I have in the Joint AI Center is to field, field fast and field at scale. So we're trying to find opportunities to bring that great research the department is known for faster into fielding. Swarming will be one of those areas. And I think it's a little bit of a transition process where it's humans, machines, and then at some point, machines to machines and more machines. The idea of a quarterback role of a manned airplane controlling maybe tens or dozens or a large number of unmanned autonomous drones or systems of some type, and then eventually getting comfortable what does swarming look like. It's a size, weight, and power question right now. How quickly can we get AI, as we say, at the edge? Most of the work we've done, almost all of the work we've done in Project Maven, and most of the work on the Jake so far has been sort of on those larger infrastructure side. It's harder to get the chips and the GPUs down to the point where I can put them in quadcopters. So we're working on the initial stages of that very problem set, taking an existing quadcopter and marrying it with computer vision capabilities. How easy is that to do? Turns out technology is changing so fast that more companies are giving solutions to the problem we're handing them on small autonomous systems. Now it's a battery life problem and range problem. We're talking potential future conflict in the Indo-Asia Pacific, thousands of miles of vast distances, quadcopters just don't work so well there. So this is on our list of things that we're going to work our way towards, starting with the smaller problem sets and then thinking more about the AI-enabled autonomous piece of all future capabilities. Hmm, That's fascinating. And Project Maven, where does that stand now? And is it largely complete or is it the sort of project that's just going to continually evolve? It's come such a long way since it stood up in April of 2017. They have 12 different lines of effort, mostly having to do with imagery coming off of either drones or manned airplanes. It's sort of different forms, those platforms and sensors will send information down to the ground. They have moved faster and faster to the point. Now Project Maven is updating some of their early algorithms almost on a 
bi-weekly or twice every month method. In the beginning, we were so proud that we could push an update out in six weeks. And yet that's not acceptable. You're talking about algorithms and continuous integration, continuous deployment. We have to get the department's infrastructure built so that could happen overnight and remotely and done just like somebody's personal electronic device done instantly globally. We do not have the infrastructure architecture for that today. It's what we're driving towards. But now what Maven is looking at is transitioning those capabilities now to somebody else. The intent is not for the Jake to own this forever. It's to get the capability built, develop, integrated, have a plan for sustainment, then transition it to somebody else. In this case, it's usually going to be a military service, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard. But in some cases, one of the big agencies like the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency who's been doing computer vision and machine learning for some time, they might absorb those capabilities for Project Maven. So Project Maven will take on some new projects over time, but more and more it'll be they have done as much as they can do transition to a service or to some other agency, and then we will converge in one way. And how exactly, I don't know yet, but Maven and the Jake. So Maven will always be focused on Intel problem sets, whereas in the Jake or everything other than intelligence. So we're doing a lot in common, but we're careful about sort of drawing those lanes because there's some things that we are doing, especially with, say, United States Northern Command in coronavirus response that we don't want to be associated in any way with sort of an intelligence function. It's a Jake function. Yeah, I see. And so Project Maven, so that focused on a capability, not on a particular implementation. Is that right? And then one of the services or the intelligence community can take that capability and use it for an implementation. You're hitting on one of the most important points that we talk frequently about here in the Jake is never again should anybody build a model and keep the model to themselves. This has to be made available to the Department of Defense. So you'll hear us talk about the Joint Common Foundation, the JCF. Despite all the other talk or things we've been saying about the missions themselves, the mission initiatives, as we call it, the projects about developing capabilities, the enduring legacy, one of the most important legacies of the Jake itself would be this thing called the Joint Common Foundation. That will be that AI, ML, DevSecOps environment, a platform unto itself built on top of an enterprise cloud, which was going to be Jedi and Cord Injunction has slowed that down, so we're working our way through some interim solutions. But the idea of having a place where anybody in the department, from a Marine on the front lines in Afghanistan to your highest end AI developer in a research lab in one of the services, can come in and have that environment where it has the most updated tools, it has the frameworks, the standards, the data repository, all of that built together is going to be an incentive for people to come in and use the Joint Common Foundation. And what we want to do is make available through that JCF all these models that are being developed that tend to be kept in a stovepipe somewhere in the Department of Defense. There should be none of that ever again, that we will build this in a way that anybody can come to those models, might have to do some retraining for their own data, against their own data, but then they will then put the repurposed model back available to the JCF. It becomes that AI ML marketplace in in its own way, as well as giving access to all the other platforms that we're all familiar with, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, C3, there's so many different platforms that are available. It wouldn't be only one of those. We want access to the best there is in the United States and international. You mentioned data repository. Is there a data repository? Because across the national security establishment, there are a lot of projects and algorithms are pretty much free these days. They're not proprietary. I mean, tweaking them may be the hyperparameters, but the algorithms themselves are open source largely. What sets a project apart is its data set and certainly in computer vision. So Is there a process or a platform for building up labeled data sets that the Jake can use or that an arm of the military could use in in training or developing systems? When you asked me earlier about the challenges of standing up the organization, what I didn't mention is the four challenges that will be completely familiar to anybody in commercial industry, data, culture, talent, and product management. 
uh, product management is not project management, but true commercial product management, which is a new thing for many people in the department. But the data piece is number one, and the lessons we learned early in Maven had everything to do with the data challenge, which was, where is the data? How do I get the data? Physically driving out and picking up tapes of full motion video is a hard way to collect data, but that's how we had to start with Project Maven. Then munching the data, cleaning it up, labeling it, and then making it available. So we did this in an enclave that is available through the department to today, but we want to make that available through this JCF, through this common foundation that is that data repository. We have learned so much about this process of data management, and more and more companies actually are offering that as a service. Don't let the department have to reinvent the wheel every time. So there are data management platforms being developed and pitched by companies just because they understand any commercial company or academia or the department is going to go through a very similar process to get the data prepared and labeled. When we've done that enough, we know what that process looks like. We've built those repetitions over time. So we will have that available in JCF. We have alternative cloud solutions right now where we're making that available. But the challenge has been not stovepiping the data. And we got involved right at coronavirus started. Some very forward-leaning people wanted to help with a national security crisis or a countrywide crisis called coronavirus. And we stood up a project called Project Salus. Salus, Roman goddess of health, well-being, safety, welfare, to go help Northern Command and the National Guard, both of whom were tasked by the Secretary of Defense to get moving on this response effort. And what did we find is what we found everywhere else. We have unbelievable amounts of data coming in, but it's in various qualities and formats. I think at the high point, just within the last few days, over 70 sources of data. Now, what do you do with that data? Everybody is working hard at coronavirus data aggregation, data fusion. What we wanted to do and have made a tremendous progress on doing is doing predictive analytics on the back end of that. So we need an environment. We have that environment platform to do that data aggregation and fusion and do the model development. Once we work our way through the last count, over 40 models, different stages of development, most of them still are very immature and minimal viable product sort of models on sort of predictive analytics. So supply, demand problems, where are coronavirus hotspots, things like that. But once we've worked our way through this, in, in an integrated product team way, which we've learned how to do in the J, we will then make not only the capabilities available to anybody who wants it by hosting it in joint common foundations, so we work through intellectual property rights, licensing, so on, but also just explain the process so anybody else knows how to do it without having to start from scratch. What's the biggest threat that you see on the horizon today? This might come across as a little bit of a cliche, but I will say it because I mean it. It's failure to imagine the future. It's failure of imagination. Technology is changing so rapidly that it's hard to understand what that future will look like in just six months to a year, never mind five years from now. Yes, we're in a strategic competition with China. The outcome of that, I don't know. and don't pretend to get into a policy discussion. But the idea of technology and the emerging technology unfolding before our very eyes means it just may be hard to imagine what that future looks like. And some people say incorrectly that coronavirus 19, CV19, was not foreseeable. It was eminently foreseeable. It was not foreseen by a lot of people. So it's the idea of what is the unimaginable? Well, it's probably not unimaginable. It's just we haven't had enough creative thought behind what does that future really look like. It feels to me like it's 1903 in Kill Devil Hills in the Wright Brothers. And we don't have 66 years to put somebody on the moon. We probably have two years to figure out what it looks like. That is what we're facing right now. We have to embrace this. As I said earlier, it's a watershed moment. Do we take advantage of this watershed moment and move faster toward a digital modernized world? And certainly the frightening thing about AI is that it doesn't take a nation state to build something dangerous and field it. It could be five people in a safe house somewhere. And it's not only that, it's no longer technology that's coming from the Department of Defense. That same picture that I just described in Kill Devil Hills, the next slide I show is the newest A100 GPU, 54 billion transistors and fabricated with a seven nanometer process, 
they put eight of those together and five petaflops of performance. That is the aircraft carrier of the future. That is the satellite of the future. That's the fighter of the future. It's how do we look at that differently than we're used to looking at capital assets that require a different way of taking technology and putting them into a new way of operating. It's not even the technology itself that makes a difference in these competitions, military competitions, strategic competitions, economic competitions, or if it comes down to it, future conflict. It's how you use the technology. So we have to work our way through what operating concepts of the future look like using these new technologies, cyber, AI, 5G, blockchain, and maybe in the not too distant future, quantum. So what's next for Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan? Are you going into the private sector? I am not a core innovator. I would never pretend to be one. I have serious limitations on my technical expertise. However, what I do bring is sort of this innate curiosity about what is happening in the future and sort of this continuous thirst for knowledge. So it surprises a few people to learn I'm going to take advantage of the GI Bill I never used and go back to school. I'm going to go down to North Carolina State and enter a master's program. And then I want to think hard about the future of the Indo-Asia Pacific and the U.S.-China strategic competition. And this is going to give me a chance to do that in a different way. But I can't stop learning, and I want to go back and try something just a little bit different for a while. As I look back at the journey, I call it the Big Bang journey, from nothing to something. It's remarkable that we were able to do as much as we did against a lot of headwinds, but I am more optimistic about what the next couple of years brings. And the team that we finally have established here, like any team of people, it takes a while to form that core leadership team. But I've been so impressed over the last couple of weeks what we're getting done now. And it just makes me so pleasantly optimistic about what the next year is going to bring for the organization. And nothing's guaranteed in the Department of Defense. Organizations come and go, sometimes seeming at the whims of the budget acts. But in this case, we're going to make a difference in a way that will change the Department of Defense. Our vision is to transform the department through AI. It's bold. It's definitely not a trivial task, but I'm confident over time we'll get there. That's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank General Shanahan for his time and wish him the best of luck in his studies. If you want to know more about the things we spoke about today, you can find a transcript of this episode on our website, IonAI, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. We love to hear from listeners, so if you have comments or suggestions, feel free to contact us. And remember... The singularity may not be near, but AI is changing your world. So pay attention.